Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's clip is from an interview we did with Marty Stewart. In this clip, Marty talks about his part in bringing Ken Burns' documentary, Country Music, to Nashville. It's extremely interesting. I didn't realize what a big, major impact that Marty had on making this whole series happen. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, Marty Stewart. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame backstage with Marty Stewart. So Marty, uh, uh, we hadn't talked about the Ryman Auditorium. I mean, what's, what's that mean to you? It's the Mother Church of Country Music kind of says it all. It was, it was, again, like country music was when I was a kid growing up, it was just part of the atmosphere of our house. It was um, the people that played there and the, and the building itself. I knew before you know I set foot in Nashville that's where Bill Monroe had put Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs and Chubby Wise and Howard Watts next to him, and they had formed what we now know as bluegrass music. Defined it, you know. I knew that's where Johnny Cash drug his microphone stand across the footlights and got sent home politely. Um, I knew from sitting on my grandmother's knee at, in her kitchen down in Mississippi after Patsy Cline and Hawkshaw Hawkins and Randy Hughes and uh, Cop Cowboy Copas had lost their life in a plane crash. They started the Opry broadcast that night with a moment of silence. I could hear people crying mm -hmm. from 380 miles away and feel their, the weight of their tears. So it was huge to me in, in my mind and in my heart. It was just Yankee Stadium, you know, Yeah. whatever. It was the Coliseum, whatever. But when I came up here on Labor Day weekend 72, Roland White was supposed to pick me up at the Greyhound station, which was basically right across the street from the Ryman at that time. At 2.30 in the morning, got off the bus with my suitcase and my mandolin, wearing my suit, you know, and, and no Roland. He had got involved in a jam session and lost track of time. I thought, well, maybe I'm at the wrong place. So I, I went around to the corner, and there was the Ryman. And it almost dropped me to my knees. It was tired and it was weary and windows were broken out and the doors were funky but it was beautiful to me and I wanted to belong behind those doors so bad and as time went on um, I loved it every time but as time we played there with Lester but as time went on you know they moved out to Opryland and it just become, became this empty thing that people would pay, you know, two bucks to go in and sit and have their picture made. And I went in there one day just to sit in the in, in the balcony and look around. And I remember a pigeon flew across. I thought, this is not good. Mm -hmm. And they were going to tear it down. And Bud Wendell was um, the CEO at Gaylord at the time. And I remember going to Bud and said, Bud, we can't let this happen. And Emmy Lou got on board. And one after another, people started talking. And the old timers didn't care. Roy Acuff thought it should have been burned to the ground, you know, 40 years before that. He didn't like it because it'd freeze you to death in the winter, burn you up in the summertime. But I saw beauty in it. And I got to cut the ribbon along with Porter and a couple other people on opening day and got to be a part of the first concert there. It's home to me. Mm -hmm. It's if I have a home show place, it's the Ryman. We did an interview with Emmy about a month ago. And we were talking about that, and, and I just, you know, I knew that she was a big part of, of helping to save it. And I just, you know, you, to me, I can't even imagine Nashville without it for some, I mean, it's, it'd be like tearing down the Capitol building or something, know. you know. And Might not have happened if Bud Wendell had not been the guy. Because Bud understood hillbillies, and he understood, you know, what we, who we were, what we were as a collective group of people, but he also understood, he, you know, corporate life, and he was the magic guy to get it done. Yeah, in Europe, they, they understand how to preserve mm -hmm. beautiful old buildings that define their culture and, you know, speak to architecture and the beauty of art. Here we knock it down and put a glass box up in its place, and, you know, we're talking about it today out on uh, North Nashville. There was a gorgeous little Gothic church that is now a Hardy's. It's like, how can you let that happen? But, mm -hmm. but it happens. It happens. But isn't it, isn't it wild that now that 
is such a revered concert hall to every genre of music just about? I mean, well, it did before, way before it was just a country music show house, remember? Vaudeville played there, you know, Hollywood's finest played there. Uh, the greatest speakers played there, opera singers, you know, played there. Uh, we just found a home of country music there, but I love the fact now that everybody comes here, and I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are, how many tickets you sell, and how many records you've sold. When you step on the stage there, it knows, again, more about you than, than you know about it. She's seen it all, that building, and I think everybody does a better show because it's at the Ryman. Yeah. How did... um the Ken Burns thing. Uh, how did that happen, and how do you did, have you seen it have an impact on on Nashville since it's been out? On the Ken Burns show on country music. Mm -hmm. Connie's son, Kerry Watkins, came was was teaching English in Taiwan, and he would come home for Christmas for a Christmas visit, and this goes back maybe ten years now. As he was leaving the house to go back to the airport one day, he said, I saw Ken Burns on TV last night, and he said he might be thinking about a show about country music. I went, ha ha. And uh, I love Ken Burns' work, so I wrote him a fan letter. I heard you might be doing, if you need me, the answer is yes, and you know I'm the deep end of the pool concerning some things about country music. Call me if you need me. And a couple of months later, I got a reply from uh, Dayton Duncan, his producer. And the next thing I know, Ken Burns is at, uh, I mean, Dayton came to the office. And a month or two after that, Dayton and Ken Burns came to the house. And the superlatives were there. Connie was there. Uh, Gary Carter, Connie Steel player. And we played country music in the living room. And the next day we went to work. And it was about an eight year job to get that done. But I knew that I wanted to be a part of that. And I knew that country music needed it because everything Ken does is evergreen. It becomes a part of the American curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I knew that all of a sudden country music would be elevated into the, alongside the national parks and prohibition and jazz and baseball and the mm -hmm. Roosevelt's and on and on, Civil War. And he brings a completely different audience to the game. And it was a labor of love. And do I think it affected country music? Absolutely. Part of the teardown of COVID is I never went anywhere. When, you know, there was like, I saw you on the Ken Burns thing. It was, the show was awesome. Mm -hmm. Just couldn't say enough good things about Ken Burns. And then, of course, COVID shut that down. But the good news about that is, is his work never goes away. Mm -hmm. And it will live on and oh, on. I watched and on. it the other night again. Yeah, <laughs> man. It's, and it's, it's solid. It's, mm -hmm. you know. I didn't know that you had anything like that. I mean, I, I obviously knew that you were on the show, but I didn't know that you were so involved in it. Oh, uh, yeah. And it, the first thing I think I remember doing when Dayton came to the office, I said, let me give you a list of people that you need to talk to yesterday. Right. Now. Don't don't ask questions. Just go do your research and go. And Dayton followed suit on that, and they got serious about it. It's awesome to watch that team work. They send a, a team of scanners in, research, uh, you know, and everything about that team is just so pro. And it's all done in a little white house up in Walpole, Connecticut. And uh, the cultural center that I'm working on down in Mississippi, the other day a truck pulls up, gift from Florentine Films. Yeah, what is it? All of the research materials that they did to produce that show, they donated to our wow, library down there. that's great. That's wonderful. Well, um, you know, obviously you know that museums mean a lot to me, music museums especially. You've got more stuff are you going to open a museum yourself? Well, we're working on a cultural center in Philadelphia, Mississippi called Congress of Country Music. And the way the state, you know, when you drive across the state line in Mississippi, it says, welcome to Mississippi, birthplace of America's music, and can back it up. You know, do your research. You can back it up. It's amazing what did and continues to come from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So the way the state lays out up in the uh, northeast corner is Tupelo, which is the spiritual home of rock and roll. It's Elvis's birthplace. Across the Delta in uh, Indianola is B.B. King's Blues Museum and Cultural Center. The Grammys put in a beautiful, incredible facility on the campus of Delta State. Mm -hmm. And the east central part of Mississippi, where I'm from, Philadelphia, is 35 miles from Meridian, which is Jimmy Rogers' hometown. 
and it'll be the spiritual home of country music in the state, of Marty Stewart's Congress of Country Music. So all of that, those archives and treasures will be on display, but it's an educational facility. Uh, the Ellis Theater is about to go under renovation as we speak. So again, life sentence, right? <laughs> That's right, man. <laughs> I feel your pain. Again, but it's our legacy. It's what we leave behind, you know. It is for and kids to study on. Yeah, and to inspire. Yeah, I I started just in the nick of time and to catch the last surviving Funk Brothers and Wrecking Crew guys and and uh, for the most part and and got them on film, but got the actual instruments that were used, you know, on so the instruments so, on the on those records. So if I'd waited another. Uh, and I didn't know. I mean, I just, I just got to the end of writing songs and selling guitars. And I was like 48, 49. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? You know. And well, that's why we did the TV show again. With the, we saw that our, that era slipping over the edge. Right. And you had, as you say, you you had two minutes to get it, and you got it. Mm -hmm. And thank you for doing it. And thank you too. And My pleasure. Thank you for doing this show. Anytime. Been friends a long time. And you bet. You know, I've, uh, I'm going to show some pictures on here of when I opened up my West End guitar shop. You, you showed up, thankfully, and uh, I've got you and Dwayne Eddy and James Burton, Jerry Lee's guitar player. Kenny Lovelace. Kenny Lovelace. Yeah. Brooks and Dunn. Yep. And I appreciate that, too. Well, talking about Blake. those musicians that are here, James. Good Lord. Come mm -hmm. on. And Gene Moles out in California, and Kenny Lovelace is one of my favorite musicians. And, and one of the nicest people in, in the world. world. And been with Jerry Lee since 1967. And he, got, he shot him, didn't he? No, not him. Oh, he's. Uh, but oh, I thought he got shot. No, not him. That was the bass player. <laughs> oh, <I think>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but come on, man. Jerry Lee hadn't been with Jerry Lee since 1967. Really? But Kenny yeah. stuck it out. Yeah, he left a long time ago. <laughs> he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you, and Love thank you all place. for watching Musicians Hall of Fame.